investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning, you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint. I'm Darshan Mehta. Let's take a look at what happened as far as the global markets are concerned. The US markets were muted in trade. Uh, uh, the Dow managed to move up slightly, but overall, even if you're looking at Europe, uh, that seems to be muted. But Asian markets have opened with a negative bias. You can see the Nikkei is down almost over 1.5%. The Hong Kong markets are down over 1.5%. So there is negative traction that's happening there. And the SX Nifty till uh, almost uh, 45 minutes ago, which was trading in a positive bias, has now moved into the negative territory. It's down almost 50 points at this point of time. How did the ADRs pan out in trade? A decent close by most of the ADRs. Wipro was up 4%. Infosys, HTFC Bank also managed to rally in trade. So positive traction, all the ADRs ended with a positive bias this week around. As for the year in trade yesterday, how did the Nifty pan out in trade? The Nifty was up half a percent and equal amount of attraction was seen on the mid cap and the small cap end of the market. If you're seeing the Nifty and the Bank Nifty, the Bank Nifty, PSU Bank Nifty continues to outperform the Nifty Bank also. As far as uh, flows are concerned, FI has bought in six 175 crores, DI is sold in 62 crores in the cash market. Uh, on the front of uh, the Nifty itself, the Nifty was up 50 points. Basically, the banks, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank and HDFC were the prime reason. LNT and Infosys also contributed. TCS was one of the uh, large caps which actually managed to decline in trade. Yes Bank and Sun Pharma were the other counters. Reliance too didn't contribute to the move on the Nifty in trade yesterday. On the future side, there was fresh buying that was seen on the Nifty. Open interest was up was negligible, but uh, a huge amount of short covering was seen on the Nifty Bank. The Nifty Bank actually saw open interest decline of almost close to 9% in trade. If you're looking at where positions are taken, we are close to the 10,800 mark in trade. So uh, call writers are active from 10,800 to high levels and put writers from 10,800 to lower levels. So that's the traction that we're seeing in. Uh, and positions uh, on, on the broader scale are from 10,500 to 11,000. What happened in trade yesterday was uh, put writers became much more aggressive. They wrote in from 10,600 to 800 and call writers from 10,900 and 11. And at lower levels, call writers were forced to share positions in open interest. Uh, two stocks that remain in the FNO band and both of them from the Adani group. The PCR for the Nifty managed to inch up, while the Nifty Bank PCR managed to come down from uh, levels of 1.44 to 1.25 currently. Uh, stocks that were in focus with so high open interest build up, PC Jewelers of fresh buying open interest build up of 15%, the counter moved up 18%. Again, the other counters saw open interest build up, but you know the moves were rather muted for all the other counters. In terms of companies which saw either long unwinding or short covering, it basically is the PSU banks, uh, Bank of India and Indian Bank which saw short covering that came in, but apart from it, the other counters were rather muted in trade. Uh, these were all the domestic cues. Let's go across to Paul Allen from Bloomberg uh, for all the the top international headlines. The BOJ's quarterly tank and survey found confidence among Japan's big manufacturers held up, but they have a dimmer view of the future. The reading remained at 19, but the outlook fell to 15, below economists' forecasts. It adds to concerns about the health of exports and investment that have driven growth in the economy. Still, sentiment remains higher than it was for almost all the past decade. The Senate has voted to withdraw U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen as punishment for the murder of dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The resolution is seen as a public rebuke of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and of President Trump, who has tried to minimize the prince's responsibility. The UN says 14 million people are at risk of starvation in Yemen as a result of the fighting. Reports from Strasbourg say a man has been killed in a shootout with police, but it's not clear if he's the person who killed three people early this week. Officials say he opened fire and was armed with a pistol and a knife. The fifth person has been arrested in connection with the Christmas market attack. Prosecutors say he's close to suspect Sharif Shekhat. The others detained are Shekhat's parents and two of his brothers. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Paul Allen. This is Bloomberg. After four years and $3 trillion worth of bond purchases, Barry Draghi confirmed it's over, but at the same time,
He's worried. He's worried about um, geopolitics, protectionism, a.k.a. trade war, stock market volatility, fragility of er um, emerging markets. So, but as I said, he's still confident in the consumer pushing the economy forward. So let's jump into the Bloomberg, a hashtag GTV chart, so you can see, uh, I think, a, a good big picture view of what we've been seeing lately in the euro economy. Because what we're seeing is these green bars getting smaller this year. Eurozone quarterly GDP growth, okay? It has definitely been on a downturn as are or is the Eurozone Purchasing Managers Index, a gauge of manufacturing but is seen as closely tied to the overall direction of the economy. Now, Bloomberg Economics um, says, yes, that these were dovish remarks and that this means that instead of a September rate hike, we may see the ECB waiting until December to make that long-awaited move. As for other central banks, Switzerland, Norway, held their policy steady, but they are concerned about risks as well, threats uh, for considerable damage uh, coming from around the world. The Bank of France cut its growth forecast. Of course, it's worried about the protesters who are concerned about uh, rising gasoline prices and more. So that's what they think is going to cut their economy. But at the same time, the PBOC m mentioning um, in their review of the economy and their challenges, they're facing headwinds. Headwinds to be sure, trade war and other things. So I think it's an interesting context uh, bringing up the Federal Reserve to see how that will fit into their discussions at this big, big meeting Tuesday, Wednesday, when they're expected to raise that key rate once more, but then send us some very important signals about what they will or won't do next year. Crude oil prices gained more than 2% on Thursday uh, as Saudi state-controlled oil companies warned U.S. refiners to brace uh, for a steep drop in cargoes from next month in an effort to prevent uh, a price-killing buildup of American stock price. Prices uh, were also additionally supported by a report from the International Energy Association uh, that global supplies may be more fragile uh, than previously thought because of unplanned supply losses from Iran and Venezuela, as well as reports of a large drop in stockpiles at U.S. storage hub in Oklahoma. Uh, additionally, mixed cues coming in uh, from the base metal space while we are seeing strong gains coming through uh, for the likes of nickel and tin ending the day higher by half a percent each. Uh, copper ended marginally higher and is on track for its first weekly gain in three weeks amid easing trade war tensions and a supply risk at one of the largest mines in Chile. On the other hand, uh, weakness coming in for aluminum, zinc and lead, lead which all ended the day lower. Uh, similarly, spot gold prices, they ended lower for a third time this week. Uh, ending three tenths of a percent lower uh, on account of uh, uh, easing trade war tensions between the United States and China. I think, uh, you know, as far as the uh, central bank independence is concerned, uh, that is something that uh, we will see over a period of time. We've had a number of finance ministry bureaucrats uh, who, and their credibility and independence was initially questioned, but RBI as an institution has managed uh, to retain the credibility and independence over a period of time. So I think one should not prejudge. Uh, but specifically on this uh, new governor, I think there are two aspects. One is the monetary policy aspect, and second is the regulatory policy aspect. Aspect. As far as the monetary policy aspect is concerned, the decisions are now made by the monetary policy committee. So the new governor, we do think, has a neutral to a dovish bias on monetary policy. Uh, but the decision ultimately is driven by fundamentals, and that does point to a more accommodative uh, rate outlook. But as far as the regulatory policies are concerned, the uh, governor does play a fairly important role. And uh, on that aspect, you know, issues related to the banking sector, issues related to liquidity, uh, we do think that the new new governor will be uh, more accommodative. Yeah, I mean, they've managed to maintain independence, but in, in the meanwhile, they've lost two central bank governors, essentially, for this reason, right? Do you expect that the pressure from the government will continue? Well, I think uh, on the uh, banking side, uh, you know, to be fair, both the Reserve Bank uh, and the government uh, have uh, equally important points to make. Uh, the economy has been hit by, I would say, you know, a credit shock. Uh, the banking system has been under pressure for many years now, and the non-banking uh, sector, which was sort of filling, it, filling in the void uh, that was left by the banking sector, has also been hit with a shock. So you have an economy which is sort of a credit-driven economy, which is seeing 
significant tightening in financial conditions and credit conditions. So the job, of course, of monetary policy authorities has to be to ensure uh, that policies uh, are more uh, counter-cyclical rather than uh, pro-cyclical. And uh, apart from regulatory policies, if you know the system as a whole requires more liquidity, then more liquidity needs to be provided. So I don't think it is fair, you know, to say that you know one is right, one is wrong. I think both have an equally important uh, point to make. Uh, we need to address the near-term concerns. We need to ensure that there is no credit risk event in the economy because of lack of liquidity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, without uh, diluting uh, medium-term financial stability, you know, of course, we do not uh, want to uh, raise medium-term uh, financial st stability risks. Those fundamentals that you mentioned that could actually support a dovish tilt, this GTV chart on the Bloomberg showing inflation easing, boosting the case for easier rate policy. So what's the outlook for inflation and price pressures going forward into the new year, new year especially when you have oil prices fluctuating? You're right. I mean, the outlook uh, does look uh, quite benign, uh, as the new governor uh, acknowledged. Uh, oil prices have come off. Uh, food prices, in our view, are going to stay quite low, uh, because a lot of the cyclical forces do suggest uh, that. And I think the one concern that we have seen in 2018 has been very high core inflation. Uh, but given the demand side of the economy, uh, which we think growth is going to moderate uh, to 6, 6.5 percent in the next uh, 6 to 9 months, uh, even the demand side inflation pressure should come off. So we think inflation is going to stay around 4%, uh, which is the uh, Reserve Bank's uh, medium-term target. So the real rates right now in India are quite high, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, a cut in the RBI's repo rate. But before that, a change in mm. the stance uh, back to neutral is what we are expecting. The state election results really were not as great as uh, Prime Minister Modi's party had expected. What impact will that have on economic policy next year? Well, there isn't much time left, honestly, and uh, the government uh, doesn't have uh, enough money. They're already struggling on the fiscal front. Um, clearly, from the BJP's perspective, the question is uh, whether there uh, something needs to be done uh, on the rural economy to sort of assuage the rural voters. Uh, but that essentially means sort of a quick fix. Uh, there are talks of a farm loan waiver. Uh, like I said, the government does not have the money, uh, but an announcement on that front uh, could be there, uh, but I think that would endanger uh, macro uh, risks. Uh, but I think more than that, it, the state election uh, results have really enthused the uh, opposition. Uh, and a grand coalition led by the Congress and a lot of disparate uh, regional parties uh, is something uh, that we will see. So uh, we do think that uh, political uncertainty will rise. And from an economic perspective, uh, that also means uh, weaker investment. And that's also one of the reasons uh, why we think uh, growth is going to slow down. Mm. Well, the TD Fat judgment has come on petitions which were filed by Bharti, Airtel, Idea and Vodafone. And uh, one of the main grounds of challenge in this petition was the definition of, uh, of significant market player that was uh, laid down by the TRAI in its tariff order of February 2018. Uh, the TRAI has, or uh, the TD has said that uh, the definition laid down by TRAI is subjective. And why is the uh, why is this particular definition important? Is because uh, when the TRAI or the TD uh, decide on the aspect that whether a, a telecom service provider has been indulging in predatory pricing, they have to first determine whether uh, it is a significant uh, market player in that particular area where where this question is being decided. Uh, apart from that, of course, there was also a challenge to discounted tariffs, uh, which basically, according to the TRAI order of uh, February 18, meant that uh, if a telecom uh, service provider is giving discount to individual customers, the details of that have to be uploaded on the website. Uh, uh, apart from that, the TRI, uh, the TDSAT has also uh, raised question on the consultation process that was adopted uh, before this tariff order was passed. Uh, the TRI has, uh, the TDSAT has said that uh, this particular consultation was incomplete. Uh, uh, in, in its final order, of course, uh, the TDSAT has asked the TRI to uh, come up again uh, with with the tariff order norms and has given six months to it. Uh, apart from that, of course, it has also uh, placed a bar that uh, no penalty would be levied on any telecom service provider uh, on the basis of the tariff order of uh, February 2018. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is City on United Breweries. Now, the brokerage has initiated 
coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 1,515. According to the brokerage, the last decade beer volume growth have exceeded that of Spirit, and going forward, to the value growth for beer is higher than that of Spirit because the market is still very small and the growth potential is very high for beer going forward, says the brokerage. Now, the brokerage is expecting the industry volumes to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 8% over the medium term. Now, United Breweries, according to the brokerage, has a strong competitive advantage in form of its dominant market share and on the back of its 21 own breweries. Along with this, the company's stride toward pr premiumization also provides a big opportunity for the company for growth going forward. Lastly, the brokerage is expecting the company's EPS to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 26% over FI18 to FI21, which is the highest growth rate when compared to its peers. And second, we have is Deutsche Bank on uh, Larsen and Trubro. Now, the brokerage has maintained its buy rating but has cut down the target price on LNT to 1620 from 1650. And according to the brokerage, new project announcements have fallen sharply, which would have a bearing on the new order inflows of LNT going forward for the next four quarters. And for the uh, and on the back of this, the brokerage has cut its order inflow estimates and the target price marginally. Now, the brokerage also adds that the near to medium term order inflow uncertainty and as well as political stability risk are a big will be a big overhang on the stock going forward however despite this overhangs the brokerage has maintained its buy rating on lnt due to a reasonable valuations and a likelihood of recovery in private capital expenditure post the election period let's say you get a windfall thanks to your excellent contributions to your employer like me or you've inherited a chunk of change from a distant uncle, or you found a few grand in a suitcase on the side of the highway. Whatever, you got some extra bread. Let's figure out what to do with that extra scratch. It's not easy to make sense of your finances. I'm Shaheen Nasiripour, and I want to meet people with an obsession to beat the system and never leave money on the table. And who better to tell me what to do with my money than a finance expert? And luckily enough, I've got three of them right here. Hi, Hi Shaheen. So we've got some extra money burning holes in our pockets. What should we be thinking about? If you have toxic credit card debt, attack that first. These are your double digit interest rates. It's, it's moving you backwards very quickly. Please get rid of that. Don't even think about it. If you've got a 15% credit card or a 23% credit card, and at the same time you've got a 3 or 4% student loan hanging out there, we might be looking at your credit cards first. And think about where those dollars are best spent going forward. At right now, we're concerned about the highest costing dollar. Your credit card is a debt that is typically based on money that you've already spent. You're finished. It's time to pay off the debt. You'll hear financial planners often talk about an emergency fund. Then you'll hear them all say three to six months is what you need. Three to six months. Three to six months of your living expenses in cash. So the most important thing about por portfolio construction is understanding which risks your portfolio is open to. So if you bought 100% of one individual stock and then that business goes out of business, you go to zero. That's go to zero risk. Volatility, drawdowns, economic events, this is part of the game. And if you're not equipped to handle the inevitabilities of markets going down and economic cycles turning over, you better reassess your situation so you don't have to be emotionally impacted by these types of events. Ideally, these will be diversified mutual funds, index funds, diversification, diversification, diversification. Make sure that you do have some fixed income in the portfolio. Even though fixed income is not going to give you the rate of return that stock market does, it serves as a temper in your portfolio. It reduces the volatility. It's not there to make you rich, but it's there to help you sleep at night. How much volatility are we talking about when it comes to what what allows you to sleep at night. If your bonus has a sizable tax impact or even takes you into a higher tax bracket, check to see if your employer has a deferred compensation plan. The advantage of that is that your compensation, this bonus that you receive is not taxed to you but goes into an account which will only be taxed to you when you begin taking the funds out. So you've paid off your debt and built a solid rainy day fund. Bravo! 
now you're ready to invest. If you're anything like me and terrified about managing your money, you may want to hire someone like Douglas, Erica, or Ian. Let's ask Bloomberg reporter Suzanne Woolley about what we should be looking for if we're looking to hire a financial advisor. Fees sometimes we might not pay so much attention to because sometimes they don't seem like they're that big. Over the years, they really can mushroom and eat away at your investment, particularly if we're going into sort of a slower growth environment. A lot of people like fee-only planners. And part of that is just because it's so transparent. You want to know what you're paying. The real key is just to be very upfront and ask your planner, what are your fees? How are they structured? Whether they are a fiduciary. This means that they have to sell you the product that is in your best interest. Maybe it's time for a financial tune-up. And for you, maybe that's saving cash or paying down debt. But personal finance is personal. So see what's right for you. Well, that last point is uh, the key. And even though those uh, people are talking about mostly investors in the United States, a lot of what they said does have bearing for you as well. If you're interested, by the way, in finding out more about personal finance, you should check out portfolio on bloombergquin.com. In fact, you can write to us if you've got specific questions on your personal finance goals on portfolio at bloombergquin.com. But let me now tell you a few stories that you'll find on the website bloombergquin.com. Yes Bank is yet to select a candidate to succeed <laughs> its chief executive officer, Rana Kapoor, and will submit a name to the central bank only after the 9th of January. The bank has shortlisted candidates for the post but will zero in on one in its next board meeting in January, it said in an exchange filing. Foreign lender Standard Chartered Bank, which has significant retail operations in India, is downsizing across its retail banking division as more and more customers move online. Plumber Quint has reported that the bank will let go of about 200 staff members, mostly in branch banking operations. That's all you need to know going into trade today. Up next is Indian Open, so do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.